Radio V. Radio in TV. Radio in TV. I wanted to kick off this week's show by playing them because we got some hip hop, uh, um, uh, I don't know, scholars, affiliados, is that the correct word I want to use? Uh, enthusiasts, fans, participants, practitioners, they are in the building talking about the Occupy art movement that is going on down in Stanford. We have uh, Sammy Aleem. He's a professor down there, runs one of the departments, right? Which yeah, department is that? The Institute for Diversity in the Arts. There you go. And we got Mr. Mark Gonzalez, who is a Renaissance man, uh, lecturer, artist, and we're going to play some of your stuff. Spoken word person, a scholar himself. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you know, you um, I want to start off. Let's talk about the birthdays of two of our founding fathers, Herc and Bam, and uh, industry or genre of music or culture that is celebrated all around the world and it makes billions of dollars but very few of those places where money is generated have even stopped to uh, take a deep breath and say thank you cool Herc or even give a birthday shout out or a birthday song you know uh, a lot more uh, references uh, a lot more what's the word I'm looking for a lot more respect is given to maybe the Kardashians, you know, if Chloe <laughs> or Kim have a birthday, they will stop and give a shout out to them and maybe even play a song or something. But when it comes to Herka Bam, on the very stations that call themselves uh, places for hip hop and R&B, they are forgotten relics. And I use the word relics very deliberately. But your thoughts on it. And I'll start off with you, Mark. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you much. My thoughts are is... It's just, first off, happy birthday uh, to elders, to ancestors, to icons, and, you know, not only cool Herc and Bambada, but, you know, all those who came before who created so many brilliant and beautiful things that we either take for granted or have benefited from, but never give voice to much less respect. Mm -hmm. um, and I say all elders, angels, and ancestors, including them, because I think what happened to cool Herc and Bambada is just, mm -hmm. you know, it's a symptom of a culture of a society, an economy, and a system that puts value over people, you mm -hmm. know, and only specific forms of economic value. And so it's like you use things, you know. We live in a consumption styrofoam culture that's like, yo, let me just throw this away. Mm -hmm. And because we're raised in that environment, we treat people with that same behavior, which is, eh, I use you, you're done, peace, you know, thank you very much, you know, and let me go get the next But do we McDonald's. do that with everybody? Because if it's Elvis, we stop. If I, it's the Beatles, we stop. But when it comes to Herc and Bam, we forget. You know, I, I often like to use the radio stations, the clear channels of the world, as examples. They'll stop down and be like, happy birthday, Paul McCartney or John Lennon, let's take a pause. But where they make a bulk of money on something that Herc and Bam helped bring to the forefront, it's relics that are forgotten, used yeah. and tossed away. No, definitely. I think it has something to do also with how we're taught to devalue certain people over others. Mm -hmm. You know, because when we talk about the Beatles, when we talk about Elvis, we have to talk about people who also, you know, borrowed or in some cases just stole outright you know, mm -hmm. other people's cultures and never gave shine to, to those who they took from, mm -hmm. you know. So you're talking about praising people who stole things. They did innovative things with it, right? you know, very much so that they should deserve recognition for it, but they stole from people and never gave it to it. So to me, it's, once again, it's just all caught up in the same behavior. Okay, point well taken. Sammy, how are you saying this? Professor well, here, Aleem. Right, professor, <laughs> professor. Uh, please address me as a doctor. <laughs> it's an, it's an, Do I have honor. to call you Dr. Professor? No. Wait, when you're a doctor and a professor, 
with a with, with what's, a, what's the what's the correct <laughs> it's uh, doctor professor with a comma phd at the end no oh really <laughs> oh wow that. no I'm just playing. you said that pretty I'm serious like you've <laughs> done this before <laughs> i'm just playing but it's an honor yo it's an honor to be here of course you know right you know, so I'm, I'm happy to be here with both of you um the way i see it is i mean i'm hearing mark talking i'm thinking this is so global in the span of the last 30 40 years mm -hmm. that what you're talking about has really even deeper ramifications because it's global it's something that has actually changed the way people live their lives decades later it's the impact is that profound right and so when i'm hearing you talking about birthday and, and birthday shout outs and birthday recognitions that should be the bare minimum this is something that has transformed and revolutionized the way people exist in the world Right, right, the way so they talk, dress, with think, talk, and dress, even approach. Think, the way they unite, the way they move in terms of body and as well as movement in terms of politics. It's revolutionized. So do birthday shout out ain't even enough, man. Do you see it as a continuum of cultural expressions or is it something that is really unique, uh, a special stop along the way of expression that, yeah. you know, that deserves its own arena, so to speak? You know, I see, I see both. I have both ways of looking at it. Like I just got back from Vancouver mm -hmm. where, talk about a continuum, okay? They had a thing at the Vancouver Art Gallery. It was an exhibit. You heard about this? It was called Beat Nation, uh, Art, Hip Hop, and Aboriginal Culture. So mm -hmm. it took it way back and it sort of overlaid indigenous, native uh, uh, sort of music and dance, overlaid that with urban, hip hop, modern you know, kind of dance and aesthetics and politics and movement and creation and sort of showed the relation. So you can go huge with the continuum, but also something around hip hop coalesced with so many different things. Right. Like the technological revolution, um, the way we're connecting over media is different now. So space has become smaller. Time has become shorter. Right. And hip hop came up, was birthed just before that. Right. Right. It was just before that. So I think its power stems from, you know, the art form, but then also the times that we're living in combined. Right. Well, let me let people know, for people that are watching and people that are listening on radio uh, tonight at Stanford, you're mm -hmm. continuing a series called Occupy the Art. Mm -hmm. um, and you've had everybody there from Angela Davis, you know, to yeah, Faviana, who's on. supposed to be here mm -hmm. today. Uh, emergency, big shout out to her. Yep. And Mark Gonzalez, who's yep. featured tonight. Um, I wanted to bring up Herc, and I'm not just because it's their birthday, but mm -hmm. when you use the word occupying in mm -hmm. art, and, you know, people think the Occupy movement, but I often say the first Occupy, at least for our generation, mm -hmm. was really hip-hop, mm -hmm. where artists were taking over spaces, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, didn't get permission. Yeah. It was like, these abandoned buildings will become clubhouses. These, uh, these walls will become canvases. Absolutely, these uh, discarded turntables will become yeah. instruments. And, and so we don't even recognize that genius, and I don't think they would use the word occupy at mm -hmm. the time, but when mm -hmm. you really think about it, you know, even from New York, even here to San Francisco, right now we're in South the Market mm -hmm. or close to it. Mm -hmm. And once upon a time, these were abandoned buildings around mm -hmm. here that people were doing parties at, mm -hmm. you know, when mm -hmm. nobody wanted to live here. Mm -hmm. Now they're mm -hmm. million dollar condos mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. but again, yeah, an no. occupying space. But I wanted to see if you can connect what, what, what I'm seeing mm -hmm. when we talk about hip hop and Occupy mm -hmm. with this Occupy art movement that you all are doing at Stanford. Yeah, I think this is, the, this is the connection, is that we often talk about the reclamation of public space through hip hop. It's like taking over public space, putting up your name, putting up your art, drawing, representation, representing yourself, your experience, et cetera. That's so core to hip hop. And what we wanted to do with Occupy art was first of all, we were talking, it's me, Jeff Chang, um, who's now executive author director, Jeff, Jeff Chang, author right? Jeff Chang, who's executive director of the Institute right now, and Ellen O, and also um, Jose David Saldivar, Ramon, Ramon Saldivar at Stanford. So it's a group of people putting this together. And what, we're, what we're trying to do is we were talking about this back in September when Occupy jumped off, and then how people sort of picked up Occupy and used it in this politically progressive way. And so we were thinking about the definition of occupation and how that transformed and it was bugging us out. And I remember being like, and I was telling Mark this, how is it that Americans have sort of rallied towards Occupy as a politically progressive strategy when our government 
is resented all around the world for its occupations of other lands and we are founded upon an occupation right so we started thinking real broadly about how artists have sort of engaged occupation have occupied spaces in order to transform them back to hip-hop early days before that we were talking native occupations we're talking about what's happening now with the Arizona, Mexico, the U.S. border. We're talking about Palestine and the occupation. So we're linking all the work that artists are doing across those areas and thinking about occupation and responding to it, transforming the spaces that they're in. Okay. That's the voice of Sammy Alim. If you're watching and if you're listening, Mark uh, Gonzalez, how are you seeing this? Um, I'm seeing it in a lot of the similar echoes um, that Alim was talking about, but also even going before Occupy, um, when you talk about reclaiming space, and it's interesting when you uh, bring up the idea of taking back in the early forms of hip hop, uh, Jeff Chang and I were talking when they asked me to come share being down at Occupy Oakland when everything was popping off uh, and people trying to wrap their head around it, like to just come speak about my thoughts. And my thoughts were three form. I was like, in any movement, you have to take a space from that space you create a base and from that base you decide direct action mm. you know and when jeff and i were talking about that he's like that's hip-hop you know and for mm. him like he, it, he was like he's like it becomes even more crystal clear for me it even goes before that because if mm. you look at like the uh late 60s and we even talked about alcatraz we go up to seattle and uh the duwamish tribe uh taking back what uh now is uh the chief seattle center um, you had a whole bunch of people saying like, you know what, we're tired of being homeless, we're tired of being homelandless, and we want our things back, right. you know, so we're going to go park up <laughs> and, and sit here for a moment, you know, we ain't going to charge you back rent, I mean, I think that's <laughs> the thing that people should actually be thinking of, it's like, how dare they take these spaces, it's like a lot of us actually are owed back rent for like you know a couple hundred mm. years right. you know and we're just saying like no like you don't have to pay us back but you know we're, we're gonna be here for a moment right. and you mm. can get used to us being here for a moment right we ain't asking you to change anything directly in our space right here, at least for the moment we're just asking you to let us be and let us be here and we're good right and a lot of people don't want to do that right just like if we were to go back to those very buildings in those very uh areas where nobody wanted, remember, nobody wanted to come south to market. Nobody wanted to go to the South Bronx. Now you can go and see pink poodles and cafes <laughs> and lattes, and, 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 and people will look at you like, what are you doing here? You know, why are you here? <laughs> well, think of it in, on, on three levels in that same way, in which right. nobody wanted those areas until they became profitable. And then entire businesses and people moved in. People took back community centers, literally sitting in them in standoffs for like weeks and months at a time, right. like under threat of violence, you know, until they were actually given the place, property value went up, people wanted it. People didn't want hip hop originally, you know, until as you're talking about, people started building entire economic infrastructures around it, and then people wanted to own it. When Occupy started, most people like, wanted to just like hate you know until actually it started gaining steam and then even within political movements people were like well how do we get them to do what we want them to right do? no one like would just validate things on its own measure and being like yo people deserve their own spaces like everyone's trying to better their lives right. like don't hate on the way people are attempting to better their lives that's really critique cool. it but don't hate on it you know let me um Yesterday, we had a conversation on the air with uh, Rifa and uh, Kofi, you know, uh, graph writers, that, you know, that are, you know, transform their neighborhoods and transforming minds. And one of the things that we were talking about is just the whole devaluing of artistic expression. I don't even like to use the word art when we talk about these expressions because it's more than art. I think when you say art, you think of something mm -hmm. that you create and then we sell it. You know, but I'm talking about mm -hmm. the song, the dance, the movement. These things go a lot more than the packaging that we associate them with. And I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit, and I'll start off with you, Mark, about the, the whole, th these expressions, their value, their devaluing, and how they start to um, become threatening for some and liberating for others and, 
and sometimes, sadly, used as tools of oppression, you know, if they're commodified a certain way and then sold back. Uh, I like to think of arts and even just the creative element as the language of memory and the language of imagination. Mm-hmm. You know, and both of those, memory and dreams, if you will, become the DNA of a culture and the culture is the DNA of a people. Right. You know, and so when we live in a world that actively demonizes and destroys certain people, part of that is attempting to destroy that people's culture. And the process through that becomes is you need to act like us. You need to speak like us. You need to dress like us. You need to talk like us. Why aren't you expressing yourself like me? Right. You know, and people have actively tried to destroy those things. And so when I think of that, I just really think about like this, for some reason, like social issue we have where people do not value people's ability to express themselves. Mm. And I think that has a lot to do with our uncomfortability to express like what we feel. You know, it's like we d- do not value emotional intelligence. And then we wonder why we wild out on one another or why that's completely left out of the schools or any of the systems. And it's like we can't even communicate with our own parents. Can you break down what emotional intelligence is? To me, emotional intelligence is really just the IQ of what you feel, understanding there's a difference between a feeling and an action. Mm. Those two are not synonymous with one another. A lot of us feel we feel something and that means we got to do something about it versus like, why am I feeling this? What does this actually mean? Where does this come from? You know, mm. have I felt this before? What are the root causes of this? Why am I passionate about certain things? Where did I learn my definition? So the of intelligence love? would be to ask those questions. Yes. Some people call that philosophizing. You know. <laughs> you can't put that, it, it, you, you, okay. Can definitely. You know, everything's <laughs> a remix. Right. You okay. know, Everything like the remix. ideas that all of us are really trying to put forth are just right. really remixes of age-old questions of okay. species. Well, that's real talk right there. What I want to do is I'm going to play a piece from you because you're going to be doing some spoken word tonight, right? Yes. At Stanford. So I want to give an example of uh, how Mark Gonzalez gets down, and then I want to come back and I want to talk to you, Sammy, so you can tell people what what the the rest of these programs entail, including uh, looking back at the 20th anniversary of not of the L.A. Rebellion, but people forget there was a gang uh, truce that took place, mm-hmm. and we'll, right. we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's uh, Mark Gonzalez throwing down for you. Assalamu alaikum. In 1975, hip hop was born. And so was I. And some 30 years later, we're asking the same question. What am I going to do with my life? This cultural kaleidoscope of liquid hope crystallizes on wax where battles a beatbox bass echoed by bombs in Iraq. We have chemical flow like the WTO barding away Baghdad and Euphrates in an economy of inhonesty that favors memorizing over original thought. And what does this have to do with hip hop? And what does a Mexican from Alaska have to do with the Middle East? Nothing. Pues nada. Unless you consider the original El Nakba of Brooklyn whose heart beats echo in Beirut streets where history free froze, replayed slow motion genesis. Mesoamerican massacres at El Masote whose Afro-Egyptian eye duct exodus followed trails of tears into refugee camps, returned to see American suburbs as settlements. And I'm just a kid from Alaska who occasionally loses himself in mosaics of music I want to compose a symphony beyond sorrow. Write psalms and surahs in the leaves of palm trees till olive trees no longer bleed in silence cause you are me and we are losing land lost like lives lost like wives lost. We who have lost children are now lost children wandering the back alleyways and brothels battling the suspension of hope like the legacies of Cairo, Sadat, Oaxaca, Vicente, Fox. So we invoke the spirit of Rakim and Nas Mahmoud Darwish, Suhair, Hamad, we are Afro-Indigenous with iPods wandering the streets of Iraq screaming, bring on the tanks. 
We the beauty behind hip hop. We don't stop. We won't stop. I said we don't stop. We won't stop from the West Coast to the West Bank. That's pretty powerful there, son. You are. <laughs> not bad. Not, not bad, bad, bad for a Mexican guy from Alaska, you know? <laughs> Let me ask you this. Um, Crazy brown people. You yeah. speak so well. Why <laughs> yeah. is that? You're so articulate, brother. Oftentimes when we talk about art in this country, we talk about the legacy and the inspiration and the genesis that comes out of the African-American community. And we see a lot of building on those traditions. Um, but, you know, during the conversation, we talked about, you know, Native peoples and other indigenous uh, expressions. And I wanted to see how you see those things intersecting. What are some of the contributions that we draw from from other, you know, peoples and traditions that we start to see manifesting itself either in hip hop or just in other artistic expressions that are now popular? So one of the things that always frustrates me is the way in which things become framed as African Americas and being like native and then this is the African uh, and I think there's something dangerous in that because it's setting up this us them and like well we did this and we contributed to this instead of saying if we look historically and we look globally and we look even presently Everyone is from somewhere. So everyone has an indigenous origin, you know. And we have to understand then that there are global indigenous echoes across the planet. Mm -hmm. And you look at Africa as a collection of tribes. When I talk about indigenous and First Nations cultures, I'm not speaking just about the Americas. I'm speaking about the many tribes, you know, the, the Mali, the Ghana, the Songhai in Africa that you talk about and then you are able to start pulling different comparisons of like wow we had the drum on this continent as well and you had a drum too and that isn't an African thing that isn't in America's things that isn't a South Asia you know Pacific thing that's a global indigenous reality of oral cultures and rhythms and the ways we connect our stories through both the combination of sound of when you get into the South Pacific, what is called sand writing, which people draw why they speak, you know, on a geometric pattern. And then we look at, well, how does that echo our concept of graffiti and telling stories? Mm. You know, it's like just these echoes across the planet that because we refer to things by nation state identities, we see them as distant, you know, or separate instead of actually being like mere or reflections of one another. That's a, that's a good point. You know, Sammy, we, mm -hmm. we didn't give you your full credit as being an author, and uh, one of the books that you've co-authored deals with, you know, global consciousness and hip-hop. Mm -hmm. And I bring that up because you've traveled the world, and you've mm -hmm. seen this long before people here were talking about, hey, they're <laughs> rapping in France and all that. <laughs> right. you, you and uh, your partner, um, uh, gosh, um, James, Spady. James Spady, were doing this long, mm -hmm. long ago. When you've traveled... Do you, you know, do you mm -hmm. see these echoes as Mark is talking about? Yeah. And can you give it some context that we can, you know, yeah. you know further dig into? Well, there's, there's two things to say to that. One is that's one of the reasons why we're having Mark Gonzalez tonight, because he makes those connections and he interconnects the, so, the seemingly disparate cultures, the w things that are seen as different, things that are created as different for us. They're made for us to be different. And Mark sees those interconnections, and that's very important what we're trying to do with the idea of Occupy Art. Now, I can give you perfect examples. For example, we were in Beirut, me and Mark, not too long ago mm -hmm. in November. And January. we were in January, my bad. Time travels fast. Right. It's all connected. <laughs> and so we were there in January, and one of the things that was, at least for me, and we could talk about this a little bit, that was the most interesting was there were scholars, and they were, they were talking about the border the U.S.-Mexico border and the wall that's going mm. up and the wall that's going up and that is up, obviously, in uh, Palestine-Israel border and making those connections. And so you had Middle East scholars of American studies making the connections from what's happening there right, to what's happening in the U.S. and trying to see the relation. And you have scholars in the U.S. trying to see the connection between what's happening on the Arizona border and, and U.S.-Mexico 
by looking at what's happening over there. And so those kinds of interconnections were huge. And while we were there, the hip hop scene, the global hip hop scene, and this is one of the things that we want to talk about too in terms of your idea of framing hip hop as an original occupation. Mm -hmm. Think about that in relation to what happened in Tahrir Square in Cairo, right. All right, where Arabian Nights songs were being performed during the physical occupation of a square for the ousting of the regime. Right. right? And, so, and, and even before that, the music was being created under the oppressive regime. Artists were creating things that could get them locked up. Right. And I found that when, when I was in, in Beirut, a lot of you probably ran into um, yeah. a lot of artists around the world speak their truth, say a, a poem like that in some yeah. places gets oh, you yeah. in jail for four oh, or yeah. five no, years. These, yeah, these artists were literally creating yeah. music and then, and then writing lyrics and shifting them around and handing them over to cops before they could perform. Because if they had performed them the way that they had written them, you know, if they knew what was going on, they would be in prison. And so they did this anyway. And then the music got picked up during the actual revolution and ousting of the, of the president. So hip hop as an occupational, as an occupying force right. in that strange sense, right, is, is very metaphorical. It's literal. It builds those kind of connections that Mark's talking about. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, too. Give everybody the information for tonight, mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping. What's going to happen here, for people that are watching, we're going to continue the conversation. For the people that are listening on radio, um, you're going to have the information so you can go and see Mark and, um, and find out what's going on at Stanford tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and then tomorrow, for those that are listening, that this conversation will continue because they're going to stay in the studio and we're going to finish our, our dialogue. But for the radio folks, let them know mm -hmm. where, um, wh what's going on tonight so, so folks yeah, can so go down. I'll, I'll give the basic 411. It's tonight, 7 to 9 p.m., uh, and it's in the main quad of Stanford University. And it's Occupy Art. And our guests are going to be Mark Gonzalez, who's right here with us, as well as uh, Melanie Cervantes and Jesus. You got Melanie coming. Yeah. Oh, Melanie's yeah. bad. Yeah, and Man, Jesus she's, Barasa, she's a, yeah. Dignidad Rebelde, they're going to be there tonight. Um, and the idea is to sort of connect, Mark can build on this, but the idea is to connect art and how artists are responding to occupation and occupying spaces across Palestine, Oakland, and Arizona. Okay. So we're going to go with that sort of global triangle and make those connections tonight. And that's every Wednesday, by the way, for the next seven weeks. Okay. Every Wednesday, Who, who do you have coming PM. next week, uh, the week we for have, when, uh, um, I think, the anniversary yep, of, we have, the, uh, of the L.A. rebellions? Yeah, so next week we'll talk about the L.A. rebellions, the L.A. uprisings um, with Anna DeVere Smith, Adam Mansbach, um, Elaine Kim. Um, and that'll be next week and the week after that. We have uh, Angela Davis coming in. Of course, she's going to be linking to Occupy Wall Street with Education and Prison Industrial Complex. The week after that, we have um, a de-occupy, reoccupy panel with uh, Boots Riley uh, from the coup. And we're going to have Fabiana Rodriguez uh, with us and Gay Teresa Johnson. And we're also connecting with Jose Antonio Vargas uh, from Defined American that week. And then we have Black Occupations. So taking this back historically, one of the things that we said was this is not, you know, Occupy is not new per se. Right. Right. So we want to take it back historically with um, Harry Elam, Michelle Elam, and Jennifer Brody, professors at Stanford. Right. And then we want to link it in later weeks to occupations on campus, how students took over particular buildings, hunger strikes, to develop the centers that we have now. Right, including the one at including San Francisco one at Sa State, yeah, which and, was and the jump off. Yeah. yeah, in many ways. Right. So, If you're just tuning in, we have Mark Gonzalez, artist extraordinaire. Uh, he is here as we continue our conversation. Sammy Aline, Professor Sammy Aline, who's also a doctor, PhD, you know, heading up the Institute <laughs> of Diversity down at Stanford. He is here. We're talking about Occupy the Art and issues related to it. And... Um, you know, we, you were just saying off air, you know, talking about the mixture that you heard in the Poetic Pilgrim song. You said, yeah. hey, that's a mariachi trumpet or something like yeah. that. Yeah, you know, that's what uh, I hear when, you know, and I love their work and uh, what they're doing is mind-blowing and people should check it out because, um, you know, both in terms of the poetics, in terms of hip-hop, in terms of the music, like, you know, the sisters are throwing down, you know, throwing down and rising up. And so, like, people need and to And making noise. Out. 
because they they they're Muslim and they speak yeah. a lot of they 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 rub they rub some people the wrong way when they speak. Well, sometimes. cats aren't quiet. You know what? I don't know where like like maybe we've been you know just like abused for so long here. Um, and I told someone that because you know they were freaking out. Um, and I think for some of us we're just so used to seeing ourselves in a coffin that we've just taken it as normal. We've taken our silence as normal. And you go to other places and it's like the recent memory of kicking out a colonialist, out of like claiming your gender, your love, your spirituality, like is so fresh. It's like in that place of like, once someone like breaks out of a box, it's hard mm. to put them <laughs> back in. And I find that globally that people are not looking to go back in. So they're a lot more vocal. Like I ain't going back there. But it seems like <laughs> there's an attempt and maybe Sammy, you could speak to this being mm -hmm. at an institution where we see programs like yours, maybe not so much on the private side, mm -hmm. but definitely on the public side, mm -hmm. the ethnic studies, the Afro, the Mexican, the Chicano, the Native American departments are all, you know, Asian studies mm -hmm. all under attack. And it's coming from these same folks that want to pass laws like they did in Arizona, exactly. where you all spoke about it last week, mm -hmm. to get rid of ethnic studies, erase, erase that memory from people's consciousness so that we will literally have people mm -hmm. that will sit in places that were hard fought for and not even care and mm -hmm. not even make the connection. When they Absolutely. see things going on, they'll just be like, well, you know, I don't know what's going on. This is something brand new. And, and they act like you have this reinventing of the wheel versus yeah. a building up on a, of, of a legacy. Can you speak yeah. to that? Yeah, I mean, one thing that's, that blew my mind, we had um, Jason Aragon, a filmmaker who did Under Our Pile as mm. part of Occupy Art last week, and um, Fabiana Rodriguez is with us, of course, and we were talking about um, how the ethnic studies, the sort of crackdown on ethnic studies, was is part of, we're watching a film about how police in Arizona are policing brown bodies and the film moves and the last clip we see is the ethnic studies conversation and it's sort of like linking the policing of the brown body to the policing of the brown mind mm. and those two as being so connected that they're not separate right and you could really see that visually is in this kind of situation where it's been linked right and then of course it's been privatized as mark was saying earlier now people are making money off of the policing of the body and the mind actually leads to more dollars and more heads in prison, et cetera, et cetera. But this erasing of, of recent struggles, I mean, it's very pronounced here, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it's just with certain classes of people that have access, and I've been railing about that, but let's take the Trayvon Martin situation. Mm -hmm. Here you have vigilante justice taking place, and we're running around wearing hoodies and Skittles, but vigilante justice was taking place in places like Arizona. That should have been an automatic mm -hmm. connecting of the dots. Like, they're, they're, they're shooting people right there. But almost every commentator that, you, that has access to these corporate yeah. outlets refuses to do that. They, they, yeah. they, their memory is not there. Yeah. And so maybe you're going, well, maybe they don't want to do black-brown unity type deal. Mm -hmm. Then you go, well, let's talk about Katrina. Because e even in the middle of Trayvon, we have the sentencing of the police that did vigilante right. justice on the Danzinger Bridge, where a 17-year-old who was suspected of being a looter was shot, mm -hmm. right? An honor student, James mm -hmm. Rosette. No connection there. And mm -hmm. when I see that, I'm mm -hmm. saying this can't be purpose. This can't be by accident. This has to be almost purposeful mm -hmm. to make sure that the institutions don't come under attack. I mean, you tell me what you yeah. see, but it doesn't seem like when you have that many people that don't connect the dots, there's an agenda going on. Right, right. Well, uh, you know, to bring up Arizona specifically when you talk about vigilante murders, not even justice, like it, it's such a perverse term to say vigilante justice. Uh, you have Brisna Flo uh, Brisinia Flores, a nine-year-old, mm, you know, right. murdered next to her father by Minutemen militia who busted in in order to try to get money for their own like drug habits even though they're claiming like we're policing the border and kills this nine-year-old you know by shooting her in the head and then shooting her father next to her right you know and so mm -hmm. we're talking about unice not isolated incidences but and, we're and, talking and, and, about and a long memory 
when we talked about Trayvon, we talked about Amadou Diallo, we talked about Sean Taisha Bell. Miller, we talked about Sean Bell, we talked about Emmett Till, you know, and you just keep on going back. But the 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 thing to me is there's that comparison, you know. But I think what we forget is like the whole conversation around the hoodie, right? You know, oh well, he was wearing a hoodie. I was like, you know what, my people fear white men wearing hoods. Far more than black <laughs> children wearing hoodies, right. you know, and so we're even having to justify ourselves as we're burying our children, mm. you know, and that's, I think, what really needs to be called out. When we talk about ethnic studies and the right of mind, and et cetera, it's like it's being made illegal for me to learn about my father's mother. Mm. You know, what kind of people or society will make it a crime to learn about your relatives? You know, this is what we're actually talking about. Like, we have to go back to, you know, just real talk and plain speak of, like, what these, like, quote, even though we're normally talking about it so often in academic or in news terms, like, mm -hmm. how this translates into our daily lives. Like, I can go to jail if I'm a teacher in Arizona for teaching about my grandparents. Yeah. Who does that? To people, what is going on in the but site? See, that, what is but the that break, But that breakdown of how you contextualize it requires critical thinking. And what's mm -hmm. also been under attack over the mm -hmm. past, you know, eight years, no child left behind, right? It's, it, it was packaged to say, mm -hmm. we're going to make sure that little Johnny and little Ray Ray and little, uh, you know, Jill and Sally all move up, mm -hmm. you know, with a skill under their belt. But what we did was we taught them how to take a test, and we teach them to take a test, and we remove mm -hmm. critical thoughts so they don't know how to apply mm -hmm. the very answers mm -hmm. that they that they mm -hmm. may actually get right on a test. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they're not to get mm -hmm. an answer, multiple choice. Yeah. You know, boom, yeah. they pass. But then you go, well, how did you come to that conclusion? Couldn't tell you Eve from Adam. The critical thinking is gone. And yeah. Do you find that as a professor, even at Stanford, that, that that's a challenge? You know what I find? I find that that's the number one thing that you could actually teach a student at Stanford or anywhere. The number one thing. In fact, in my, in my class last week, two weeks ago, I just got done telling them literally straight up, if you can't critically read any of these texts that are coming at you and moving at you all the time, you are of no use. Hmm. That's straight up. So how do they digest that and, and adjust? It's, if probably, it's, it's one of the first times anyone's ever told them that because that's how things happen. If you can critically read everything around you, right, then you can be of purpose. But if you can't, right, you can't make those links. You can't link what's going on in Arizona to what's going on, right, the things that Mark that you just talked about, to what's going on with uh, Trayvon Martin, to but what's going on with Shaima Lawadi, right, the Iraqi woman right. who was killed in California. So you, you can't make those links. But when critical thinking people present information without that critical analysis, mm -hmm. then there's an agenda going on that right. we have to look at oh, and say, this man. is, you are deliberately absolutely. trying to dumb no. down and yeah. hide something. There's a reason why we call no child left behind, no child left. Because mm. eventually that's the outcome. And yeah. you just become a consumer. That's it. A consumer. There's no child left. You know, where do you see art going now? Um, I wanted to... Uh, play maybe for people that haven't seen the Tupac video, um, what took place in Coachella, maybe we could do oh, that, right, yeah. you know, where right. we saw, th it's not actually a hologram, it's, it's a 2D rendering, but we all call it a hologram, because mm -hmm. that's what I thought, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was right here that, you know, maybe about a couple of years, a year ago, that most Def did one, but he did it mm -hmm. to get people to uh, um, get into uh, the science field. Yeah. Which, uh, was it, which is very mm -hmm. interesting. Again, that memory mm -hmm. gone, so people forgot that right. most deaf was here in Oakland, California, doing a, a, a hologram for, for kids in the hood so that they could go. But let's take a look at this Tupac thing, and I want to find out the direction of art and technology because I think this epitomizes it right now. Underground, <laughs> right? That came up with a song, came up with an album called Sex Package. And Sex Package was a whole thing that they wanted to have people um, believe was real and they wanted to say it was something that was invented in NASA, in NASA 
right? They did this in 88, 89. They went around the country giving out pamphlets talking about if you take a pill, you can have this, this, this sex, <laughs> you know, a sex package would, would basically be like a hologram, you know? And here, here we are 20 years later, Tupac is alive. Coming out of the digital underground camp, we should actually ask Shock <laughs> and Money right. what they think of this. Right. <laughs> the, irony of, the irony of that. Anyway, tell everybody um, Occupy the Art again. Where yeah. can we find it? What's happening so with it is, in Stanford? This is Occupy Art every Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m. at Stanford in the main quad. Okay, so yesterday we had Mark Gonzalez, but next week it's going to be who? Well, we got Mark Gonzalez tonight. And uh, Dignidad Rebelde also tonight. And then we have the L.A. Uprisings that's mm. coming after the next week. Uh, Adam Mansbach, Anna DeVere Smith, uh, Ruben Martinez, and others. Week after that, we got Angela Davis coming. That's going to be, you know how that's going to be. I mean, right. I have to say it's going to be crazy. Uh, the week after that, we have a number of things happening. Ruben Martinez is doing a show on anarchy. Oh, okay. He's a performer, writer, you know, from L.A. doing a show on anarchy because that's part of the whole you know, origin. Blurred, and this is, epitomizes it because it's like Tupac is dead, but maybe he's alive and he looks alive and uh, I want him to be alive and we can make him come back to life. And, you know, it's just all this this stuff, but it's it's technology unbridled. Well, how are you seeing it, Sammy? I'm seeing is I want to see a Malcolm X hologram. <laughs> hologram <laughs> <laughs> i'm imagining the possibilities right, right. imagine po so on one thing on one level people could look at it and say actually people in vancouver were saying i don't know in vancouver they were talking about this being like i don't know if this if people are getting ripped off or what like are they getting right. what they paid for etc on the other hand it was like yo people were crying when they saw Pac. right like people were crying when they saw him and on the on the the global tip that we've been on like when you talk about artists in palestine seeing a Tupac video and being like, yo, he's talking about our hood. This is it. And then creating something, you think about the potential maybe of something like this, sort of a disembodied kind of art. That's the positive, you know, that's the, the positive outlook. Right. Is sort of looking at what is the potential. And then my mind starts racing on what are we going to actually do with this? Right. How are you saying it, Mark? Spoken word artist, do we put a Mark and Valus, a hologram up while you, you stay while home. You're here, while, make, you're while you're here. You, while you know, here. You know, you, you might be in three cities on you a panel. You clone yourself, finally. <laughs> so a friend of mine, Nazar Watad, is a screenwriter, and he's worked for some rather large film companies, uh, as well as for Sundance. Uh, young brother, um, uh, early 30s. And uh, he always ends up, he's a huge graphic novel person. Right. Loves having conversations on the planes with people. Two years ago, I think it was, he was on a conversation and he, he came, we were going to an event uh, to do the Brooklyn Beats, the Beirut Streets uh, show. And he was like, I just had like, you know, the most interesting conversation on the plane. It was with the scientist. He invents holograms. <laughs> and he was working for the music industry. And they were talking about like what it would mean for the same way people do jukeboxes to rent out a theater and to have holograms of a Jay-Z concert, a Black Eyed Peas concert across the U.S., simultaneously people going to watch it, mm -hmm. you know, in the collective experience, mm -hmm. you know. So this was two years ago, okay. you know. Yeah, and then yeah. when I'm watching this, I'm like, oh, this is, you know, yeah. what is it's the direction it's going in. Right. So I, my, we all are multiple-sided people. You know, we all have like our creative side, our emotional side, our family sides, our loving sides, you know, and they all intersect inside of it. So my mind is racing when I see yeah. this, you know, on one side is a person who loves comics, who loves, you know, CGI animation, etc. I'm like, yo, son, did you <laughs> see that? <laughs> like, what's going on? You know, right on the second, there's an emotional side. Like when I was talking with the friend who was like, yo, it's Tupac. And then when he went off stage, you know, and I'm like on the hologram, they're like, I saw, almost started crying. Wow. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, what we talk about for me, the, my thoughts actually first went to Leila Steinberg, Fini, uh, Shakur and QD3 and just being like, I wonder what they're feeling right now. Well, the Fini loves it. You know, and I, I talked saw, to, and I, I, I and I talked to Mo Prem. He loved yeah, it. Yeah, and yeah. I think there's right. something to be said though for people who have worked through the trauma of premature death of a loved one. Right. You know, and some have, and others haven't. 
for me, it's, you know, the, the question of, is it, you know, what about this and that? I'm like, it's a family question. You right. know, they, uh, all the rest mm -hmm. of us have opinions. Him up there is a family question, right. you know. And at the end of the day, it's what they decide. The rest of us, you know, we roll with that. Um, but just the technology now, you know, what this means and what this doesn't mean, if we're talking about a world that is increasingly feeling it's connected, but in reality is disconnected, you know, that that is going to bring back, that's going to bring to life something mm -hmm. that I don't know we've fully explored or thought about. It's going to be something new. You know, the type of relationships we have because we're on Twitter and we're on Facebook. They're friendships, but then you stop to think, I never really sat mm -hmm. down and talked with you. Never seen you face to face. But I've talked to you for like three years on Twitter. And, have, you know, and I mean, these are all new new things. I'm sure you get that, you know, you meet someone and they're like, oh, yeah, I'll follow you. And then they start telling you what you just did. And you're like, I just <laughs> met yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. This is a <laughs> little bit like, 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 like bugging me out. Like, right. yo, like, you know. But at the same time, we present that information publicly right. to everyone. Somebody, j I forget their name. Someone just did a TED Talk. It was on how smartphones are affecting our ideas of relationships. Yeah. You know. Psychologists are actually looking mm -hmm. at completely in the field of how originally MySpace, you know, what would be considered a, a social media or Web 2.0, well, the interactive right. space. Well, I know the United Nations had a whole thing on this a couple of years ago, and they determined it was digital immigrants and digital natives. And for people who don't know the difference is, I would probably be a digital native, meaning that I can operate completely comfortably in digital space. I can do everything off a phone and off a computer. I don't need anything printed. I don't even have a printer at home anymore. You see what I mean? Because I can operate really fluidly. My mom, you know, you got to go print this up and she got to hold something. She got to read a book in her hand, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. None of this on the computer screen, but I can write essays and completely exist in that. And younger generations do this younger and younger. And it's like, like fish to water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it's not just an art question when you're asking, like, what does this mean for art? Mm -hmm. Like the idea of holograms, et cetera, when we consider outsourcing online education and webinars, you know, what does this hold in terms of the way that we think of how we interact with even knowledge? Mm -hmm. You know, are we looking at a future of even educational spaces where it's like someone records something and then you just got this hologram in front of you, you know, teaching you? Because that's basically what online education mm -hmm. is in right. terms of like response back and forth. You know, and so all of these to me are just, there is no answer. That's the reality is mm -hmm. it's the reality of our time is we have to ask whole new questions. Yes. You know, yes. that have, were never even possibilities before because we're inventing technology mm -hmm. that we don't know what can do yet. Like, yeah. you know, when people, when you think of the internet, when you think of texting, even the Twitter folks were like, when we invented it, we did not realize we were creating a real-time news feed for the planet. Right. And, you know, Twitter started out as a, um, as a podcast thing. Yeah. You know, it was Adam, I forget who it was, but we were on there real early as a podcast home. And then they said, we got this thing called Twitter. It's like, what? <laughs> it's like, you just put like 140 <laughs> characters and tell people where you're at. And it's like, get the hell out of here, you know. So, <laughs> so there's a certain amount of skepticism because I was like, get that. Man, I'm not. Go, go on with yourself. And yeah. now, you know, everybody's on there. So yeah. I, I wonder when we look at this hologram and some of this stuff, that skepticism is that, you know, that, that natural reaction to change. Well, I'll tell you, man, when I look at it, my, I'm thinking potential almost immediately just because right. maybe it's Pac, right? So I'm thinking potential in how many different ways because, we are in a time where the body is disconnected from everything. If you notice, that's mm -hmm. what's happening. They're pulling our body away from information, away from our loved ones, our relationships, right. away from our places of birth. Everything is sort of being pulled, the body's being pulled away from everything. So when I see Tupac without a body, right, <laughs> right but with a body, it makes sense to me when I see science moving towards cloning. You know, all the, the reduplication of everything, it makes sense to me. But then I see someone, I know there's some of my students who have never seen Tupac who are at that show. I know because I made them write a paper about it. Okay. They're going to study the show. And this so is you're what the type of professor. Go to yeah, Coachella and write exactly. a Exactly. I'm like, yo, one Man, student, I need can, to I take go, your class. can I go because it interferes <laughs> with class time? I'm like, write a paper and okay. then you can go. But see what I'm saying? But they're oh, okay. thinking about these issues in the middle of time this is happening. And they're now having a live Tupac memory. 
How many people went to see Tupac live in a big stadium and only saw the video screen anyway? Mm. So they're yeah. having the same live Tupac memory that I had years ago and that you had, but they're having it almost in this, in this weird twilight zone era, but the connection, because memories are fabrications, right? You know, right? that's interesting it's a that you said that you forget. You, yeah. A lot of times we go to concerts and we watch it on a screen anyway. Yeah, so it, yeah. the connection, yeah. the, the neural networks that are, the connection that are being built mm. are, I would bet, identical. Okay. Right, well, so yeah. Yeah, the potential is what I see. I see what could we do in terms of, it's not always what, power is doing with technology to keep us subservient etc it's like what can we do with holograms so then what can what can you do now occupy the art stanford mm -hmm. you're sitting up there at the farm you got all kind of resources <laughs> you know comedy <Connie> rice <laughs> yeah. hangs out there sometimes yeah. you know He's my girl yeah <laughs> people might believe you man be careful now <laughs> but um with with with, 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 with where can you see things going you know especially if you're talking about art now yeah i mean i'm thinking about this as a way to do what we're thinking in our heads right now so the reason why we're putting on occupy art is to make connections all around the world and bring them home to the farm to the campus every week and have people basically living a global experience without going so that all these ideas are coming to the same place okay right and so they're thinking about that so i think technologically this might be not specifically holograms but it's the same idea of how can we connect people in order to get that critical thinking going in right. these new ways i see power there that's a point well taken do you bring that conference that um takes place in beirut and I'm not sure if it's the same one I went to, but people are talking about censorship and all that. Do you bring that down to Stanford soon? Man, I think we should. Yeah, I think we should. I mean, we'd be Because oftentimes when you go to these conferences, we're the belly of the beast that they talk about. Yeah. It'd be interesting to have that conference here. Well, you know, the American, because we talk about American studies in the United States all right. the time. Right. It takes on a very different sort of issue there. Issue oh. and meaning when you're talking about American studies. That's the empire occupying imperial yeah. force in the place that it's actually occupying, right? Yeah. It takes on a different, you know, much more different family. Well, I mean, even right now, they say that uh, they're building the American University campuses in Afghanistan because they're like, we want to make sure we leave an education infrastructure long after we're gone. Um, we want to make sure we continue the occupation long after right. we're gone. You Occupy know. the mind now. They're, yeah, it's all you know. And, but in, in any of that, it's interesting because after the Occupy Art, I fly out the next morning to uh, UW Seattle, and they have one of uh, the few programs in the nation that has a master's in communication and digital media. And they're hosting a conversation on hacking EDU. What is the future of education? And some of the people mm. are gamers, some of the people speaking, um, the founder of the first fully accredited online university, and we're actually trying to have this conversation of like mm -hmm. really what does all this technology mean? Right. And it, you know, when you talk about having it at Stanford, people forget that Stanford developed the economic model for the app industry. You know, mm -hmm. what came out of one class, which was don't worry about the old model of how is this going to be sustainable. Get mm -hmm. as many subscribers as you can. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll make money off an advertising revenue. So it was, I forget the professor, one class that literally tried to make as many games as possible and get as many mm. subscribers as possible, which shifted the whole, mm -hmm. basically the birth of like Angry Bird and everyone who you're like, how is this making money? And then you got that little banner right. at the top mm -hmm. and like 10 million downloads. Wow. You know, and checks being going with each time a banner goes up. You know, we, we're going to have to get ready to wrap up. Um, first of all, I'm going to have to have this conversation for the folks that's watching, you know, here on what is it wednesday nights what nights is the am the uh uh anime folks coming at thursday at eight yeah thursday yeah, yeah, at eight yeah. they got some brothers that coming in they do the whole anime gamer thing so you, you're you're getting into their <laughs> realm we're gonna have to have more sit in the room and and have them break a lot of this stuff down i'd be interested to see what they got to say yeah about the Coachella thing. They're pr knowing them, they probably be, oh man, we've been yeah, doing yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. This when, the school. new, the new thing. School. I made that, didn't you know? But I do want to say one thing on the anime thing. I mean, not the anime, but on the hologram thing. Long time ago, there was a group called Digital Underground. <laughs> right? That 
came up with a song, came up with an album called Sex Package. And Sex Package was a whole thing that they wanted to have people um, believe was real. And they wanted to say it was something that was invented in NASA, in NASA, right? They did this in 88, 89. They went around the country giving out pamphlets talking about if you take a pill, you can have this, this, this sex, <laughs> you know, a sex package would, would basically be like a hologram, you know. And here, here we are 20 years later, Tupac is alive. Coming out of the digital underground camp, we should actually ask Shock and Money <laughs> right. what they think of this. Right. <laughs> the irony on. of the irony of that. Anyway, tell everybody um, Occupy the Art again. Where yeah. can we find it? What's happening so within Stanford? This is Occupy Art every Wednesday, seven to nine p.m. at Stanford in the main quad. Okay, so yesterday we had Mark Gonzalez, but next week it's going to be who? Well, we got Mark Gonzalez tonight. And uh, Dignidad Rebelde also tonight. And then we have the L.A. Uprisings that's <coughs> coming after the next week. Uh, Adam Mansbach, Anna DeVere Smith, uh, Ruben Martinez, and others. Week after that, we got Angela Davis coming. That's going to be, you know how that's going to be. I mean, right. I have to say it's going to be crazy. Uh, the week after that, we have a number of things happening. Ruben Martinez is doing a show on anarchy. Oh, okay. He's a performer, writer, you know, from L.A. doing a show on anarchy because that's part of the whole you know, origin. Meantime, we're going to leave out of here with Nas and Kanan, two people from different continents coming together, Somalia and Queensbridge, talking about what life is like in their respective hoods. So, peace out, everybody. See you around. Radio V. Radio in TV.